It's Waxing Miracle, baby. Hello, Waxers, and welcome to Waxing Miracle Means and Dutch. I'm your host, Means, and my colleague just turning down a lovely glass of black tower. It's Mr. Neil Dutton. How are we, Neil? Rather lick piss off several warm nettles than drink not, not that. A, not a wine drinker, especially not a low alcohol white wine drinker, obviously. No. That's, I mean, if you're going to drink wine, presumably you're drinking it for one reason only, and that's to get plastered. So why would you drink the low alcohol version? Yeah, it's that, it's that, um, it's like that non alcoholic beer concept. I don't really <laughs> drink alcohol, uh, beer for the, for the lack of alcohol. <laughs> Yeah, there's there's a word that you won't use when you're drinking booze. I'm like, oh, that's delicious. No, it's not. If it was delicious, we'd be drinking it all the time. Yeah. It's not a nice taste. It's just, mm, that's not bad. Yeah, it's not terrible. It's not terrible. Mm. As you can tell me, Neil, professional uh, alcohol drinkers. Neil, drinking alcohol with the uh, with the famous at the weekend, uh, Mr. Alex Geller from NFL Fantasy Hours. Alex, Neil. Excellent, um, most enjoyable. Um, we, we, I introduced him to the joys of the Ship and Mitre in Liverpool, which is, you know, obviously going back to the ale. It's a real ale pub um, for real people. Um, so um, we, you know, we shot the breeze. There was a few more people there of uh, who Alex had agreed to meet. You know, other other fans of his. It was it was good time, good time had by all. And uh, I didn't have a hangover, um, despite I put I put a shift in. Excellent work, Dutton, excellent work, excellent work. So, busy week this week, as always, Dutton, I guess, even off-season, we don't rest. A couple of classic Weird World stories to start. Then we've got um, the brilliant Fran Duffy um, trying to help us prove that this isn't an Eagles podcast. Oh, wait, um, someone who works for the Eagles specifically on the show. And then, Dutton, um, um, I suppose we should talk about a certain... Um, CBS television analyst and uh, how his retirement and subsequent move could affect the NFL in multiple different ways. That sounds like a plan. I shall point out, of course, though, that the now five Redskins beat writers slash, you know, you know, correspondents or whatnot who don't even have the decency to reply to emails are not exactly helping your cause. To be honest, Dutton, it doesn't surprise me. Like, they're too busy, like, you know, cowering in a corner, writing terrible stories about how awful my franchise has been over the past six months. <laughs> Which is just one of them things. One of them things, Dutton. So, I mean, let's get, st- let's get straight on with the show, Dutton. Let's talk Weird World. And, you know, sometimes I look at the Weird World stories, I scour the internet, get a few tweets from a few people, and sometimes a headline just jumps out at you, and it, and it just means you have to talk about this story. And Dutton, the headline reads as such. Horse rescued after falling into hole on way home from Taco Bell. Okay. I didn't I didn't need to read anything else, really. I just saw that and was like, yeah, I'm in. So a horse in California had a rough experience after a late evening visit to Taco Bell. The horse and rider were returning from the Mexican fast food chain near downtown Riverside on, on Saturday when the, the cover of a utility vault beneath the sidewalk collapsed underneath them, dropping the horse into a five-foot deep hole. Dutton, what's the strangest thing has ever happened to you when come, walking home with a McDonald's? Um, I, I think once, uh, and probably only once, uh, I didn't finish it. Um, but, you know, I think the most worrying thing is, you know, the, wh- why would you take your horse to Taco Bell as surely there's a better than you know 50% chance that the next time you go, you'll be eating it? Yeah, I look at it, and I'm like, there I was, riding my horse through the centre of California, and I thought, I want a Taco Bell. Question one comes to my head, did you do drive-through? Um, second of all, then you thought, did I get anything for the horse? And then third of all, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to ride it home. I'm worried, though, that this is the second uh, week in a row that we've talked about Taco Bell. Maybe that's just a coincidence, Don. Do you know what I mean? I don't know. I don't know. But uh, I just thought it was brilliant. And uh, to be honest, the story's not that... Well, it's obviously tremendously weird. But what I love about it is just the fact that it's got one of the greatest headlines of all times. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a beauty. Final story, Dutton. Second story. Um, um, we've all watched yours, right? It's a good It's a good film. Back in the day. Scared a few kids, I'm sure. It looks ridiculous now. Like It's not exactly a CGI heaven. But, it, you know, these things can happen. So when you get a title of the, such as 
seventeen year old fights off shark attack to escape Florida panhandle attack. You've got to read further on with the story, Neil. A teenage girl Absolutely. fought the teenage girl fought off a five foot shark with a punch in the face after it grabbed her by the leg on off the Florida panhandle on Sunday, authorities said. Caitlin Taylor, seventeen, needed eighty stitches for a six punch for six puncture wounds to her right leg she sustained while flip swimming at a Destin, Florida beach, according to her mum. She was visiting from Lexington, Kentucky, was swimming in, in the waist deep water around 3.30. So, so, we've both been to Florida, and one of the things that people tell you about Florida is don't swim in the water, there's stuff in it. She's from Lexington, Kentucky, so obviously she's there on a holly bobs. You know, she's probably gone to meet her, her, her brother and her sister who were married. Um, and uh, Whoa. <laughs> just went there, and so you're like, why are you swimming in there? But the question I have for you, Dutton, uh, a shark comes at you, you try and swim away, it grabs you. Do you think you have the uh, balls to punch it in the face? Apparently, the best way to defend yourself from a shark attack is to punch it on the nose. Um, but it's worth pointing out that this this is one hundred percent true. This is the the ultimate survival guide. If you are being attacked by a shark, a shark will only attack you. If you're wet. So if I'm in the sea, how do I get dry immediately? This is what we're asking well, yourself. You're in the sea. That's you, you've 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 taken that barrier away from you know you've you've taken the the avenue of safety away. So what you need to do is get out of the sea and get dry because no one has ever been attacked by a shark walking down a high street, or I'm guessing in Kentucky, when she probably should have stayed. I, I'm suggesting that could well be the case. Don't I? I would I would. Uh divert you to the sci-fi channel and Sharknado's numbers one through four, which may suggest differently, but I do understand what you're saying. I hate to bring it up to you, that's not a documentary. Hmm. Ironically, Dutton, um, you're right, but if you, we do love a weird story and you never know, that might be one of them. If you've got any weird world stories, three places please, at ndutton13, at mainz7 and at waxing underscore lyrical. Uh, we're always interested in, and they always make us laugh don't we? absolutely um, after the bizarre uh, after the bizarre and ridiculous let's get on to the absolutely brilliant Fran Duffy to talk NFC East draft I think is the best way to describe it and probably concepts of why Dalton's GM is secretly Harry Potter So, with draft fast approaching, we thought we'd get ours, and Ross took his favourite college expert, Fran Duffy, you can be found on Twitter, at FDuffy3. Dutton always also loves him, and so do I, uh, because of his knowledge of the NFC East, although Dutton loves him because, obviously, he's, an, he's massive on the Eagles, and is especially the Eagle in the, in the, the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast, easy for me to say. Fran, welcome to the show. Again, how are we, sir? Uh, I appreciate you guys having me. Thanks, guys. I'm doing great. So, as as I've mentioned, you know, Dutton tries to turn this into an Eagles podcast as much as possible. So, we may as well start there. And I guess the the easy question for me is, given that the Eagles have acquired Timmy Jernigan for the price of moving back 25 spots in the draft, can we now definitively say that Harry Roseman is the second best wizard behind Harry Potter? <laughs> Well, I'll let you guys make that determination. But, I mean, obviously the, the addition of Timmy Jernigan is really exciting because, you know, you get a young player. He's 24 years old. Obviously, he's entering a contract year, but uh, a very talented player. So now the Eagles have the ability, if it does go well in 2017, to retain his rights moving forward. They have the ability to sign him to a long-term extension, uh, whether it's in the middle of the season or once the, the 2018 offseason hits. They've got the ability to, to control his rights and bring him back. You've got a player who was built to play in a scheme like Jim Schwartz's because of his aggressiveness, his ability to hold up in the run game is as good as most of the nose tackles you'll see. They're 25 and under in the league. So being able to add a player like that, like you mentioned, for the cost of moving down 25 slots in the third round uh, is a really good get. And it's really, really uh, exciting to see the kind of addition of a Timmy Jernigan to this defense. Do you think the um, the team, as we say, we're approaching the draft? Uh, are we likely to see um, any marked differences in draft strategy, considering that Joe Douglas is now on board? Um, bear in mind what he's done while he while, was at the Ravens and last year with the Chicago Bears. 
You know, I, uh, that's a good question, and I, I guess we're all kind of waiting to see. I, I just think that right now they're in the they're in the business of acquiring the best players that they can, uh, and I think that that's the the route that they're going to go in this draft is they want to try and surround the their star quarterback Carson Wentz with as much talent as they can. But that means on offense and on defense, they want to make it a very well balanced team, uh, and I don't think that they're going to turn their nose up to a player that can impact either side of the football, regardless of position. Uh, I think this is a team looking to acquire the best possible players they can, and they'll let it all sort itself out once they get to training camp and, and see who comes out on top when it comes to position battles. So I, I wouldn't rule anything out when it comes to any stage of the draft when it comes to this team and as they're trying to build this roster up. So in, in this in this draft, um, most mocks have the Eagles taking a cornerback of 14. Um who should the Eagles fans be looking for at that spot? And, and do you think there's a chance they might go to for a different position? Especially now you look at that. And like, I know I was reading a tweet from Robert Mays, who, who loves a, loves an O-line and a D-line. And you look at that that Eagles D-line now, and you're like, you wonder if me and Dutton could play corner, given the fact, given the max, the expected pass rush from the Eagles. We couldn't. We could try, Neil. <laughs> You know, I think that the big thing is is with the, the strength of this class being at the cornerback position, you don't need to force a pick at number 14 on the cornerback spot. And I think that's the, the important thing is that if the, if the Eagles, if the, if the cornerback spot isn't the, most, uh, isn't the most talented player on the board at 14, let's say it's a, a running back or a receiver or an offensive lineman or a defensive end or a linebacker, uh, I, you know, I don't think that they would – just reach for a corner just because they feel that they have a need there on their depth chart at that position. The fact that it is so deep and the fact that it is so full of players that could potentially come in and start from day one that you might be able to find that guy on the second, third, fourth round in this draft. I think that that gives you the flexibility to not have to spend that first round pick on the position. Doesn't mean they won't. Doesn't mean that that if they get to that position and they say, you know what, uh, this player that we have here is the number one player on our board at this point. Let's pull the trigger. But I don't think that they're going to force their hand at that spot. Um, in, obviously, um, there's, there's still question marks about Ryan Matthews. The Eagles drafted Wendell Smallwood last year. Running back is still you know, something of a position of, I'm not going to say need, but something that needs to probably be upgraded by the Eagles. In his time as an offensive coordinator and head coach, the Eagles lead, uh, the Doug Peterson's lead running back only averages about 14 carries a game and is involved in the passing game. Now, one person whose numbers seem to be, you know, um, comparable to that is a somewhat polarizing figure. That's Joe Mixon. Do you think, I'm not going to ask you to, you know, to say regarding the morals of the pick or whatnot, do you think if he were to be selected by the Eagles, would he be a good fit for the offense? Well, yeah, I think when you look at some of the things that Doug Peterson has said in the past about what he likes at the running back position, and a lot of the things that he has brought up are the versatility and the ability to impact the passing game as a receiver out of the backfield, and Nixon certainly can do that. But that being said, there are a lot of running backs in this draft that, that can do that. You look at a Christian McCaffrey out of Stanford. You look at Alvin Kamara out of Tennessee. A lot of people like what Dalvin Cook can do as a receiver out of the backfield as well. Uh, you know, even if you get to the lower rounds, I mean, you talk about a guy like Elijah McGuire from Louisiana Lafayette, a Donnell Pumphrey from San Diego State. There are a lot of really talented receiving backs in this draft. And if the Eagles decide that Joe Mixon is a, is a good fit and that he would make sense, then I think that you could see that. But I do think that there are lots of other options in this draft that uh, and that's what makes the running back position so interesting in this class is that there are so many players that could fit the bill for a number of different teams. And when you look at the way that the Eagles like to play football, so many different kinds of, of run plays in their scheme. I mean, you can look at all the different zone elements in the offense, all the different gap elements, a lot of misdirection. So uh, any one running back could potentially fit in what the Eagles want to do. And, that, and that's what makes it really interesting to see how they decide to approach that position. If we if we drift into the other teams in the NFC East, Fran, um, Brian Ramjack is is a name being linked with the Giants. You know, the, the the tackle class isn't 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 seen as that strong this year. Is he someone who could who could be an instant upgrade at the uh, what we would describe as the the starting ten style spot, or as they would describe it, left tackle? <laughs> yeah, I think that you look at a guy like Ryan Ramjack, and, and he certainly is a player that. Uh, what, what stood out to me was how polished he was for a, a first-year starter. I mean, he's only started 
a handful of games now for the Wisconsin Badgers. He transferred up from the D3 ranks. Uh, he was a local. He didn't have – it's not like he didn't have those D1 offers. He was offered by Paul Chris when he was at Pitt. Uh, to go and join the the Panthers, but he wanted to stay close to home. He was from Wisconsin, he, so he went to D3 ranks, and then when Chris arrived at Wisconsin, he said, you know what, let me go give this a shot. He redshirted his first year there last year in 2015, and then he becomes a starter, and he took he took off, and he was one of the best linemen in the Big Ten. So you look at Ryan Ramchek, he, he, obviously the, the injury is a little bit of an issue. You're a little bit worried about the hip. But on the field, I mean, he's as talented as any of the other tackles in this class. And it is a good group overall. And when you look at the offensive tackles in terms of some of the players at the top, it's not star-studded like some of the years we've seen in the past. But I think it's a little bit a little bit overblown in terms of how bad the class is. I mean, it's not very deep. It's not the strongest we've seen. But there are some talented players. You mentioned Ramchek. You talk about a guy like Cam Robinson. Uh, Garrett Bowles from Utah is very athletically gifted. You look at Cam uh, uh, Antonio Garcia from Troy, Taylor Moten from Western Michigan is a guy I'm a big fan of as well. There are a lot of interesting tackle prospects in this class, uh, and it'll be interesting to see where the Giants decide to go because obviously they just spent a high pick on Eric Flowers, and he does not seem to have worked out. So how they decide to approach that position will be very interesting to watch. Would they just move? Oh, would they just sorry, move Flowers to? Would they just move Flowers to right tackle, Fran? Uh, my guess would be that he would either go to tackle or uh, potentially even to guard. Some people thought that he was a guard coming out of Miami. So uh, either way, it wouldn't surprise me at all. And one of the film, uh, one of the games that I've seen uh, Ramchek playing, um, Wisconsin. I didn't get his name. A Wisconsin quarterback was left-handed, um, but I don't know his name. Uh, so that's obviously not the most well-prepared uh, question. We talk about like players having difference between swapping between right and left tackle. Is it actually different being a left tackle in college with a left-handed quarterback to coming into the NFL and playing left tackle for a right-handed quarterback? Would that be? Would that require any great changes or coaching? No, I don't. I don't think that the, it'll make a difference for the tackle whether or not the quarterback is left-handed or right-handed. Not in terms of a, anything drastic. I mean, obviously, you will have to deal. Uh, with some different things in terms of the quarterback maybe being more used and more prone to rolling left or right. But overall, I mean, his technique isn't really going to change and the way that he's going to play is not going to change. However, if a team looks at him and says, you know, what, we want to move him to right tackle, that will require an adjustment. And, I, and I'm not sure going back to his years in D3 whether or not he played at all on the right side. Uh, but that uh, when I talked with, with uh, former NFL offensive linemen, one of the, they'll say that one of the biggest challenges they've ever faced is when, not when they moved from tackle to guard necessarily, but more when they moved from the left side to the right side and back again because you're switching up everything that you want to do. Uh, you know, from in terms of muscle memory, it's all completely opposite. So that would be a very tough change and something that it would, it would be a projection. It would be something that would be very interesting to watch uh, as he transitions to the NFL if any team looked at him or any of these other tackles and said, you know what, let's move him to the other side where he's not used to playing. Um, turning to um, America's longest-running soap opera, or the Washington Redskins, as uh, some people still call them, um, they seem to have lost an awful lot of offensive weapons um, this offseason. Deshaun Jackson, obviously, to Tampa. Pierre Gosson to San Francisco. Given the uh, additions they made in the past, do you see them, um, do you think maybe they'll have to go a bit offense-heavy in this draft, or do they have more gaping holes on the defensive side of the ball that they really need to address? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you look at the players that left, and they're the first team to ever lose 2,000-yard receivers in one offseason. But, you know, obviously, Jamison Crowder is still there. You still have the talented tight end group uh, that we've seen in the years past. They just drafted Josh Doxson with, the, with their first-round pick a year ago, and he missed the whole season. So they're expecting him to come in and have a really big impact in his second year. And I would imagine that some of those other young players that they have in that receiving core, they're going to expect to step up. Now, that being said, I wouldn't rule them out in terms of any of the, the early picks, whether it's day one or day two at the receiver spot. But that being said, they need help on defense. I mean, Kirk Cousins has that offense operating pretty well uh, as long as he's the quarterback there. But I think when you look at defensively, they need help on the back end. They need some depth up front. They lost Chris Baker in free agency as well. So they're going to need some re replenishment there. Uh, inside, they need some help at linebacker. They drafted Sua Cravens, and, and he spent some time. And he was injured. So uh, I think that they could use some help really at all different, all three levels of the defense as well as outside the perimeter of offense. If we could, if we could talk about Docks and Dutton before you dive in, I want at least two minutes on, on Washington here. Um, <laughs> He, he's, he was injured all the last year, but 
coming out of TCU, there was massive there was massive hype. He was seen as an an, a, an excellent player. Did you, from what you saw of him in the Big Twelve, do you expect him if he can stay on the field to have an impact for Washington? You know, I, I would expect him to. And he was a guy, he ran a little bit of a limited route tree there for TCU. So I would hope that, you know, with his time that he's now spent now in the NFL and with an NFL coaching staff, that he has hopefully honed those route running skills a little bit. But you're talking about a player that can go up and attack the football. He can get downfield vertically. He was one of the best athletic testers at the Combine in 2016. So he's a guy that can hang in the NFL in terms of playing out in space. I'm anxious to see him and see how he looks one year removed from being a first round pick i think Doxon is incredibly talented and, and some made the comparison to aj green uh because of his body type and his movement skills obviously that's a player that jay gruden was very familiar with during his time in cincinnati so could he be used in some similar ways that aj green was used while gruden was there with the bengals and, and that would be very interesting to see you you've you've aj green you've, you've got me at aj green Fran, you nearly knocked me up i nearly fell off my chair um <laughs> final final question and, and final team although they, they they would never see themselves as the final team in the nfc east and that's the dallas cowboys it the the defense it lost a lost quite a number of players due to free agency and it needs um reinforcements all over but names we've seen linked especially one of the names is derek barnett I guess what he, he's a defensive end from Tennessee, for those who aren't aware, and he, he recently broke a notable form of volunteer sack record. Is there any way you could use your powers of influence to keep him away from the Cowboys? Because as we've got Kirk Cousins and, and yourselves have got Carson Wentz, we could do with them staying injury-free and standing up as much as possible. Yeah, that that would be ideal. Uh, unfortunately, I wish I could have a little bit more of an impact on who the Cowboys did draft or did not draft. It. But you look at Barnett, I mean, he, he's a very talented pass rusher. Um, you know, in terms of the athletic gifts, they're not as uh, top end as some of the other players that we've seen come out in recent years. But he's a really good player. You know, one of the things that stood out to me this year is, you know, he, he was able to win in a number of different ways. He's a really good run defender. He can drop in coverage if needed, but when he gets after the quarterback, he's got such a relentless style of play uh, that makes him, you know, really just a, a very likable player to watch on film. And so that, that Barnett is a guy that, that I'm a big fan of. Um, I would imagine, I think Albert Freer from uh, MMQB just put out a list of 18 of the players that the Cowboys are hosting on pre-draft visits. 17 of the 18 were defensive players, so it definitely seems like a lot of their focus seems to be on that side of the football. That That's disappointing, as, as I was hoping that, that Jerry had been too busy helping um, Tony sort out suits for CBS, but it seems like he, he has been paying attention to what his team needs as well. <laughs> yeah, it certainly seems that way. Well, well, Fran, as always, thank you for your time. We know you're a very busy man, especially this time of the year. Um, and we hope to speak to you again soon. Absolutely, guys. Appreciate having me on. Thanks again. So, Dutton, the always informative and, and, and brilliant Fran Duffy there, helping us out on the NFC East and obviously uh, telling us that uh, he believes that, that uh, Harry Rose might actually be a better wizard than Harry Potter. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I was hoping that maybe we could, you know, we could be the start of, you know, whipping up some kind of negative press about um, about Derek Barnett. But then you actually look at the players that Dallas actually draft or sign that would make them more likely to take him. I think. Yeah, I think we need to start saying how amazingly good for the community um, Derek Barnett is, as that may mean that they, uh, you know, don't sign him. It's so- open. Dutton, I mean, you know, let's let's get to say to before, before we finish the show, we got what there's only really one piece of news, right? And that is um if Phil Sims is, is no longer gonna be annoying us on the on on, on the sky's second game. He'll find a way. As 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 I believe he's 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 already as a Andrew Brandt would say, friend of the show, he's already speaking to his lawyers, as there will be lawyers on this one. And yeah. and it looks like Tony Romo, instead of um being behind centre next year will be next to Jim Nance after he finishes his master's stint um, working for CBS. So I guess I guess the question Dutton, is if we look at there's, there's three teams I, I want to focus on here and get some kind of feedback on and that's that's first of all let's look at the Cowboys. I mean, what does that do for the cap? What, what, what's the what's the situation on the cap with with, with Dallas being involved there? 
Well, to, um, Romo had a 19 million cap charge for the 2017 season um, because they've designated him a post June 1 cut that gets split across the 2017 and 2018 seasons. So basically, it's bought them. Um, what was it about? Uh, about eight and a half, about nine, nine, to, nine and a half to ten million cal- uh, salary cap space for the coming season, which they desperately needed because their rookie, uh, the estimated um, rookies' uh, wages would be about five million dollars, and I don't think they had it. So I guess, I guess, they this is now. I mean, not that we didn't think this was Dak teams anyway, because we thought he was going to get traded or he was going to get caught. I mean, the difference is he retires, and we'll talk, we'll talk about how that affects other teams. But it's just now they stumbled upon Dak Prescott. He was fantastic last year as a rookie. Do you know what I mean? He did really well. Good, you know, and he's he's got the solid foundations as we've all as we've discussed before. You know, he's got wide receivers or, or friends. In that position, excellent offensive line, Ezekiel Elliott. Or but you know, me and you could do that job. It seems like we just assume now that this is that this is purely all in on Dak. Well, the big advantage, of course, when you happen upon a quarterback in the later rounds is, uh, especially in the later rounds, is that they're cheap, and you know will be cheap for the first four seasons, well, first three, because then obviously you can start negotiating. The Cowboys have been one of the worst managed teams in terms of cap uh, management um, since since the cap started. <clears throat> Excuse me. They continually kicked the Romo contract further and further down the road to the end that basically he was untradeable. You know, um, he was untradeable because no one's going to take that contract on. No one, you know, except a fool or a hero or Bill O'Brien. No one was going to do it. This team. I mean, the Dallas cap, you know, the high profile sporting positions, you know, you've got England test captain, uh, one of the captains for the Ryder Cup, the Dallas Cowboys quarterback. It's one of the most high profile ones you've got. And Dak Prescott came in. Now, there was always the safety blanket that if he all of a sudden falls off the cliff, Tony Romo can come back. Well, the training wheels are off now. So, this is Dak Prescott's team. But it's a question of. Are they going to do basically continue to do what they've done um, since Scott Linehan turned up, which is incredibly odd considering how pass happy he was in his early years? Are they going to pound the rock? Are they going to pound the rock? Are they going to let uh, uh, rely on Prescott to be efficient in his decision making? Um, probably. I mean, they've they've committed to him. They've taken this. They've gone this far. <clears throat> they've said goodbye to Tony Romo. They obviously have faith in Dak Prescott. Not that much faith, because obviously people are saying, you know, this is the strategy. If they thought he was going to be a superstar, they'd have drafted him in the first round. And it's the same with the Seahawks with Russell Wilson. So don't buy that crap. The obviously big big factor is the Cowboys aren't going to be the same team next year because even though the defence wasn't particularly talented, it was very well coached. It's lost an awful lot of pieces. But Prescott has shown, I think, enough, and there are enough tools around him that if they can run the same offence as last year, he can still have a good season, he can be the leader of this team, and he can still be relevant in fantasy as well, because he was actually the QB6 in his rookie season. I think that's a good question, don't they? It, uh, and you bring it up, it's on leadership. That You know, I think that we underestimate, you know, Tony Romo had been there, what, nine years? Um, um, he'd been starting for nine years and starting he's been there since 2003 yeah so starting for nine years so that's a, it, it it will be a leadership void I mean we don't we don't know what, what what it was like last year it may have been awkward you know I'm sure that someone like Tony Romo seems like a nice enough guy people you speak to says he's lovely but you know he's a competitor you know he's, he was quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys do you know what I mean it's not mm. you, can't, you don't get there without being competitive so you know that kind and but that you know that kind of who Dak, Dak Prescott you know Leans on relies on that that that's gone. Obviously, it's now as you said, definitely Dak and Ezekiel Elliott's team. As we've seen from Elliott, you know he he looks like someone who needs someone to give him an arm around the shoulder. Do you know what I mean? He's not exactly living a dream at the moment in terms of leadership. And I, I just wonder if that may be one of those hidden things that you know people talk about and then some d- dismiss just for talent. Of you know what's he going to do in in the locker room? How does that change? You know, is there more of a what about oh it's just me now? What how does that affect Dak? I guess we'll only we'll only we'll find out soon enough. I guess. Well, I mean, the big decisions will be when we've seen that this this Cowboys team is happy to feed Ezekiel Elliott because you know the game script they are able to keep it close. If they have a situation where all of a sudden they're chasing the game and they're not running the ball thirty forty times, 
And well, who's to say Elliot? I mean, we saw it happen in college. He came and called out the uh, coach for his play call. Do we know that Dak Prescott isn't going to be the first person he throws under the bus? Because I'm the first round, you know, superstar. I was taking fourth overall. You're just the fourth round quarterback. I'm, I yeah, hope I it think- happens. Yeah, I mean, yeah, as, as Eagle and Washington fans, don't, we're, we're not adverse to seeing that happen. The thing is, that, you know, Tony Romo was on the Dallas Cowboys. He's always been on the, the Dallas Cowboys. But the biggest te- the team that took the biggest hit by his move to CBS is the Houston Texans. And, and that's plain and simple because they were expecting, you know, whether they'll, whether they'll admit to it or not, to have Tony Romo playing this year behind centre. So I guess... They're drafting at 25 due to foolishly getting into the playoffs last season. And I guess the question, and they're winning a game even. You know, what do they do now at 25? Are they going to have to look to, are they praying that the, the, Deshaun Watson and, and Mitchell Trubisky don't, don't go, which won't happen? Do they have to lose more draft collateral drafting up? Or do they have to take someone, you know, later on, like Patrick Mahomes and, and whatever, and play the lottery of can we get one of the lower draft picks to be any good as a quarterback? Well, I don't think they're going to go for a rookie because uh, Bill O'Brien has already come out and said that it's awfully hard to put a rookie in that situation. And we know that Bill O'Brien's offense is linked to the Patriots' offense, which is quite complex. And I really wouldn't want a rookie coming in, especially, say you've gone from, you know, these ridiculous air raid spread offenses, and then you've got to come into this you know, timing base, option route, very, you know, complex offense. No, that's that's a, that's one way to get yourself fired. Obviously, they're going to have to draft a QB because their QB situation is Tom Savage and Brandon Whedon. That's, this team, is, it's a quarterback away from challenging the Patriots. I genuinely believe that. At every spot conceivable, they can match up with the Patriots except one. And it's the one, the position that the Texans and Bill O'Brien have made a career of getting completely wrong. It's oh, I honestly don't know what they do. They, they they can't bring Kaepernick in because he can't run that scheme. They can't bring Cutler in because he can't. But O'Brien will kill him. I think you know he he came to blows with Brock Osweiler. He'll be getting dragged off Jay Cutler. You know what I mean. And it's just, what did he do? Ryan Fitzpatrick? No, he's done that. You know, it's, it, absolute head scratching. That division now is it's wide, wide open, and it shouldn't be. It should be the Texans' division to win. Let's be really honest. As we stand now, Tom Savage is the starter, and any of the free agents that are out there, as you said, they're not going to pick. They're not going to pick Jay Cutler, or that would be hilarious. They're not going to pick Colin Kaepernick. Uh, he doesn't run the scheme, regardless of the other things we talked about last week. You know, as you said, Brian Fitzpatrick already happened. So as we stand right now, you know, for what feels like the tenth consecutive year, the Houston Texans are a quarterback away and they're starting someone. They aim me this time, Tom Savage, who would be, you know, third choice on most depth charts. Rick Smith has been GM for eleven drafts so far. Do you know how many quarterbacks? In the first three rounds, the Texans have taken in those eleven years. It's either it's either going to be zero or eleven, Dutton. Zero. Did you look this... at their quarterback? Their quarterbacks have been well. Uh, Rick Smith's been there, so it's eleven drafts. We'll go back to what two thousand and five. Well, Matt Schaub. They was yeah. They were still faffing around then with uh, Derek, uh, with David Carr. Then they got Matt Schaub through uh, free agency. Then they decided they didn't like Shaw because he was broken, and that's when the merry-go-round started. That's when you had your Case Keenum, your TJ Yates. Um, I think Jeff Gus, Jake Delon played for them once as well, I think. Then you had you know, Ryan Fitzpatrick, Ryan Mallett, Brian Hoyer. I don't understand how... And The sad thing is there's a YouTube clip. It's a Bill O'Brien coaching uh, clinic when he was at Penn State. And he says... Basically, the things he labels as indispensable to have as a quarterback, saying, you know, it's the most important position. You can't operate our scheme without a quarterback. Then why can't you find any? You made Christian Hackenberg respectable. Yeah, I know what you're saying, but Christian Hackenberg was a five-star recruit. Um, I think 
well, I'll, I'll probably recorrect it, but it, it was something like that. I just look and just think, as you said, you know, in the same time, around the same time, I think like the uh, the New England Patriots have drafted three or four quarterbacks in, in the top three rounds. Let's think about that, right? The Houston Texans have never had really a franchise quarterback. They would suggest that Matt Schaub was. Okay, fair enough. He did quite well under Kyle Shanahan. By the way, let me paraphrase that with Kyle Shanahan. Um, mm. Most do. Most do. Have a look at the stats. Um, Bo, and did so didn't draft anyone. Whereas the New England effing Patriots have had Tom effing Brady and done it three or four times. Let's think, that's, that's why... You're the Houston Texans and they're the New England Patriots. You're think See, you're, you're standing still. They're moving forward. I'm always of the um, the Bill Walsh, uh, Mike Holmgren approach. In whatever round, every year, draft a quarterback. Whether he becomes your you know your future starter, whether he becomes a solid backup, or whether he becomes trade bait, draft a quarterback every year. Don't don't but more often. Yeah, Don't but argue, occasionally, I totally agree. Totally agree. But occasionally, me. try and make it a good one. Yeah, yeah. Every now and again, pick one that you know might be useful. Final team, Dutton. Um, is, I, I want to talk about the Denver Broncos. Did they just pretend they don't care? Just ca- casually move. You know, we've all done that. I, I wasn't even involved anyway. Just s- slowly whistle down the street as they move quickly along, thinking that, tell, convincing us all that they were always going to play Paxton Lynch. Yeah, didn't fancy it anyway, you moose. Um, <laughs> exactly, we've all been there, right? I was I mean, just talking to her to be friendly. Yeah. Shut up, you tit. Um, <laughs> ultimately, they're exactly where they were to start with. Um, they've got two uh, low price quarterbacks. Obviously, Patton Lynch is going to be a bit more expensive. The other fellas are undrafted free agent. Their offensive coordinator, Mike McCoy, is able to craft his offenses around the personnel av- available to him. Um, so, you know, they've got decent wide receivers. Um, they haven't really got much of tight end. Running back's a bit up in the air. Get a quarterback who can adequately carry out that task, whether it's Simeon or whether it's uh, Paxton Lynch. Simeon, you know, if he does well, basically he's going to get himself a nice payday somewhere down the line. Uh, Paxton Lynch, you'd expect, if it's a tie, you go with the first rounder. You've, that's what you drafted him for. But ultimately... They would they would they would have been the most risky to put Tony Romo behind uh, an offensive line because they haven't got one, and you know John Elway was able to go off into the sunset. Peyton Manning was able to go off into the sunset. Tony Romo would have gone off in an ambulance, and you know I've, if you'd had to go through all that faffing round to get him, that's the last thing you'd have wanted to see. Yeah, I don't, I'm, yeah, absolutely. I think final thing for me, I just look and think, you know, for for a long for a long period of time. Um, the Premier League or Premier League t- television coverage has tried to copy, um, tried to copy the NF- what the NFL have done, and I wonder if the NFL have tried to copy what the Premier League have done recently with Messrs Neville and Carragher, and to a, a less extent Frank Lampard, who's, who's only done a couple of shows and gone, you know what, you know I know people say oh they got no media training or whatever, but these guys have been interviewed possibly a hundred billion times, they are tremendously knowledgeable of the game. And people seem to have an opinion about them, like or dislike. And they seem to have personalities. So let's get them talking in front of a microphone as much as possible, as quickly as possible. I mean, Nasser Hussain went from the England, you know, the England test line up to the commentary box within two weeks. You know, it's not unheard of, you know, in sports like that. You know, if you're erudite, if you, you know, have a good personality, or if you're a bit abrasive, like, you know, like Nasser can be. You can make that transition, but ultimately, as well, you know, the one person we haven't actually talked much about is Tony Romo. What a clever decision he has made! Says someone with glass knees, a bad back, and you know, a declining shoulder. Actually, worryingly, he's not the you know not the most healthy. He's had an awful lot of operations. He's made an awful lot of money, and he's decided, nah, I'll do something. It's time to do something else. I think it's really clever, Dutton. And do you know what's also really clever? Is for the next, I don't know, two years, maybe maybe just this 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 season and next season, teams will be throwing money at him to try and get him back out of the booth in a John Gruden, John Madden, B 
Bill Cower type strategy. And all he's got to do is be good at his job, which I think he can be. You know, he seems so. very erudite. I, don't, I think he'd be good at his job. I hope he is. Do you know what I mean? I like, you know, my hatred of, of, Phil, uh, of Gary Neville. Phil Neville still exists. Gary Neville's gone. He's now a pundit and he's very good at his job. Do you know what I mean? And like, I hope that Tony Romo is good at his job. There is nothing that makes you appear better at the job you used to do than not actually doing it anymore. Absolutely, Dutton. Absolutely. Never fails to amaze me when when you uh, when when that happens, especially when we talk about former NFL coaches being in the booth or in the sta- in a stadium in in a in a studio show. I am sure teams will be flocking to call Rex Ryan in eighteen months' time after his is 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 what I can only believe is exceptionally good stint on ESPN. Mm. Even though the track record will show he's a better person in the booth than he is in a, in a on a sideline. Yeah, but he will have learned up, Moni. Do you know what I mean? It's one of those type of situations. That's what they'll tell you, isn't it? Oh, well, he's learned yeah. now, so he's a better man for it. Yeah, we all know how you know how easily and and you know how easy the Ryan's uh, move on and uh, accept new ways of thinking. Yeah, just, exactly. just ask Kevin. Just ask Kevin Gilbride. Exactly, Neil. Exactly. That's it. That's the Roman situation. We talked to Fran Duffy. We've told you about you know a horse falling down a hole while having a Taco Bell. Uh, any final thoughts, Dutton? I honestly don't know how you can top it. I think you know you, you, you hand me a horse down hole. Exactly, exactly. You know what? That's been waxing lyrical, and these are top guys out.